You do it right? Two hours? No. No, I'm disappointed. I have to cut a half of my sermon off. Well, it is good to be with you. Uh, we pastored at Perm for about 17 years, and I've been at uh, Detroit Lakes for the last two years, helping fill in there, and uh, really enjoyed that. But enjoy being here to meet you and, and be with you. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke 
Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, and then we'll look at 11 through 16. Kind of two different stories that I sent. Too often we look at one of the stories and we get kind of an uh, uh, unfinished version of what Jesus was doing. And we'll look at both of these stories as we share together this morning. A few years ago, American Idol judge Simon Cowell, how many of you are in his Facebook? No? Oh. Well, he was asked uh, what they looked for in contestants at American Idol. He said there's two things that he's looking for. First is originality. How, how uh, unique, how different are this person? And secondly, he called the wow factor. He or she must wow him and the audience. This is one of those passages this morning. It's the wow factor. Only they didn't use the word wow. The Bible doesn't use that word. It uses the word amazed. In Luke 7, we have two stories that we're going to look at. One, the first story is where Jesus was amazed. And the second story was the people that were amazed. And I think those two stories together give us a, a composite picture of what Jesus was doing. So let's jump in. Luke 7 verse 6 says this, what amazed Jesus. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And Jesus said to the crowd, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. You wouldn't imagine the guy that he's talking about is a Roman. And you wouldn't imagine he was a Roman soldier. An officer in charge of a hundred soldiers. His servant, who he cared about deeply, is, is sick and Whatever they've tried hasn't worked, and so it's either die or some miracle has to happen. But he hears about this Jesus guy who's been in the news on CNN and whatever other programs they had at that day. He hears about him and he hears about his reputation to be able to heal people. And so he decided to take a risk. And sometimes it is a risk, isn't it? To ask Jesus for something that we, we want and we desire. And we know he can do, but we don't know if he will do. So he takes this risk and asks a Jew for help. He's a soldier in the mighty army of Rome, and he's asking for help from this nobody, back town person, Jesus. He formulates this plan in verses 3 through 5. The centurion heard that Jesus and some of the elders of the Jews to ask Jesus to come and to heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, when the elders came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, saying, this man, this Roman soldier, desires to have you to do this because he loves our nation. You don't read that very often where a Roman loved the nation of Israel, loved the Jewish people. But this Roman soldier was probably a God-fearer that he accepted the Roman, that he rejected the Roman gods and trusted in the Hebrew gods. This man deserves you to do this because he loves our nation and he has built our synagogue. You, you kind of favor him, wouldn't you? He comes along and says, well, you guys need a new church here. I think I'll pay for it for you. Uh, how many of you would welcome him aboard? Well, that's kind of his reputation here. So, so the Jewish 
leaders, the Jewish elders from that synagogue, vouch for their Gentile friend and saying he's a man of integrity and he's well liked by the Jews. Jesus' response, verses 6 through 8. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to talk to you, to come to you. But say the word, say the word and my servant will be healed. I think this blew Jesus away and the people around say the word and, and my servant will be healed. He said, and here's, here's the kicker. If there is a kicker. He says, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, he goes. Tell that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. He's saying that I have power. I have power over the people that, that are under me. And he had this unusual understanding of who Jesus was and how Jesus, how God operates through Jesus. He was a man acquainted with authority. And he recognized that Jesus is a man with authority too. Godly authority. Authority even over illness. Authority even to cure at a distance. And he, and he saw a parallel between the way he commanded his soldiers under the emperor's authority and the way Jesus commanded diseases under God's authority. That's the connection here. He had this understanding that many of the people didn't have. He said, I'm under authority and Jesus is under authority. I have a right to exercise my authority and I believe Jesus has a right to exercise his authority. So, so the greatness, greatness of this man's faith was not merely that he believed in Jesus and that Jesus could come and heal at a distance, but that to the degree to which he had understood that Jesus, whenever he spoke, he spoke with God's authority. So, so what does Jesus respond? How does he respond? What does he say? This is kind of an unusual thing. We don't have too many Roman soldiers coming to Jesus for help. As far as I know, this is the only one. It says, verse 9, when Jesus heard this, when he heard what the centurion was saying, or what the elders were saying that the centurion said, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. If you read through the Gospels, Jesus isn't amazed by much. But this amazed him. And turning to the crowd following him, so there's not Jesus and just his disciples, but Jesus, his disciples, and many other people, he turns to the crowd and he starts preaching a sermon to them, kind of, kind of a mini-sermon. He says, I tell you, I've not found such great faith even in Israel. And, and, and notice he contrasts. I expect to find it in Israel, but I don't expect it to find it with a Roman soldier. Here is trust, confidence in Jesus' authority, aware of Jesus' right to exercise his authority. The centurion committed the well-being of this servant who he loved and cared about. He committed him to Jesus' hands. And Jesus is amazed. When's the last time that Jesus amazed you? I think we who've been raised in the church, grown up reading the Bible, reading the stories, going to Sunday school, going to Awana, going to Bible school, sometimes we just come and 
we look at the scripture and we go, oh, I've heard that passage before, Pastor. Move on, move on. He was amazed at what this man, the understanding he had of who Jesus was under God's authority. And Jesus is amazed at his great faith. I heard this definition of faith years ago by Dr. John White in a book he wrote called The Fight. And it stuck with me ever since. And he says this, faith is obeying God. Faith is obeying God in spite of the circumstances and in spite of the consequences. How many know what Romans, not Romans, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, what that chapter is about? Faith. Faith. Good. And it goes through a number of people, the faith, the faith, the faith, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Noah, by faith. And if you take that definition and apply it to them, it really makes sense. Because in every one of those cases, by faith meant they obeyed God. Moses obeyed God, part the water, even though he'd never seen that happen before. By faith, in spite of the circumstances, in spite of the consequences. And the centurion knew that the soldiers under him obeyed him. And he knew that as crazy as it sounds, he knew that sickness and disease obeyed Jesus. Have you thought of that before? That not only Jesus could heal, but the sickness and disease obeyed Jesus. The centurion had authority over his men. Jesus had authority over sickness and disease. And so the Jesus, and so the centurion is asking Jesus, Jesus, would you please, even though I'm not worthy of it, would you please exercise your authority and heal my servant? And Jesus did. Verse 10. Then the men who were sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Returning home, the messengers find the servant healthy. He'd been healed. The request has been granted. The servant has been healed, and Jesus had the authority, as a centurion soldier thought he did, had authority over sickness and disease. And, and now Jesus is amazed and responded to the great faith of the centurion. Now, too many times we stop at this story and we think, and the preacher usually says, and you need to have great faith, like the centurion. Now, have great faith. Read your Bible, pray more, have great faith. And I come away sometimes saying, I'd like to, but I... Sometimes I don't have great faith. Sometimes I struggle with my faith. Sometimes I wonder if my faith is real. But the main point of both of these stories, as you'll see in a little bit, that Jesus responds to great faith but he also responds to no faith. Let's look at the next story. Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 16. This is what amazed the people. Jesus was amazed. Now the people are amazed. Verse 11, soon afterwards. So soon after means soon after the centurion's servant was healed. So that story is still fresh in their minds. The people were following the crowds, his disciples. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his followers and a large crowd traveled with him. When they came near to the town gate, he saw a funeral. A mother, who is a widow, 
had lost her only son. Now, let's not just read a, words on a paper. A widow lost her only son. And here was the funeral. And usually funerals were the same day. They didn't wait two or three days. It was the same day. And this large crowd from the town was with the mother while her son was being carried out. In this story, the characters and circumstances differ from this powerful centurion to a powerless and right now hopeless, grieving widow and mother. In the story of the centurion, Jesus is seen as in the role of a responder. He's responding to the request. In this story, Jesus is the initiator. He gets involved even when nobody asks him to. Do you see the contrast between the two stories? Here in verses, seven through, or verses 11 through 16, we see this widow. And what a contrast. No power, no authority, no great faith, no hope, and a dead son. And Jesus comes along without even being asked, and he initiates this scenario. I'm guessing this woman is so overwhelmed by sorrow and grief that she really didn't even have time to pray. Her son had died that day, probably. She didn't even know that she could ask Jesus for help. Maybe she never even heard of Jesus. I'm sure she prayed before her son had died and was asking God to, to heal him. And she was a widow at a time in history when women were almost always dependent upon men for food and shelter and clothing. So this wasn't just she lost her son. It meant that he died probably leaving her destitute. Her son's death was probably her death sentence. And more than the reality of the economics was the tragedy of losing a son, losing a child. We all know that the basic right and order of life is children are supposed to bury their parents, right? My children are supposed to obey me. I obey me, that too, but... <laughs> They're supposed to be living long enough so they can bury me. This was out of order. The older we are, the sooner we're supposed to die. Aren't you glad that I came today, old people? <laughs> Us senior citizens. But it's the truth. This funeral procession from the village to Nain, of Nain to the cemetery is profoundly out of order. This woman had lost her only son, the source of her social security. She had given him birth. She had cared for him when he was sick. She was there when he took his first steps, when he said his first words, when he lost his first tooth, and when he first learned how to drive his own chariot. She was there. She loved her son in a special way that only a mother loves a child. Now, I love my kids, but there's still a difference between the way my wife loves them and dotes on them and says, you know, than, than what a father does. At least that's my opinion, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> She's desperately alone. Even in the midst of a crowd of people, she's desperately alone. Verse 13. 
when the Lord saw her. Do you ever wonder if Jesus sees you, even in the midst of a crowd? When the Lord saw her, he felt very sorry for her and said to her. Now, again, we don't know if Jesus had ever met her before, if she'd ever met him. We don't know that. But chances are they had never met before. And this man comes up to her and says, don't cry. Now, how would you feel? You just lost your son, your only son, your social security. And this man that you don't know comes up and you says, well, don't cry. Don't cry. I, I, I am guessing there was shock on her face. Like, really? <laughs> don't cry? Whatever, you know. I want you to hear this. Jesus cares about us. He shares our joys. He shares our sorrows. His heart is broken when our hearts are broken. Jesus isn't cold or calloused or uncaring. Jesus is profoundly sensitive to our pain and he shares our grief. Not only this story, but many of the other stories about Jesus tell us that. Then comes this awesome and amazing and, and shocking miracle. Verse 14. Jesus went up and touched the coffin. Now the coffin in those days were just simply like a stretcher that we would call today. It wasn't, you know... A, a box. It was a stretcher. Jesus went up and he touched the coffin and those carrying it stood still. It's like, whoa, what's happening here? You're one of the pallbearers, huh? Whoa, what's this guy doing? <clears throat> but I'm guessing that Jesus had such a presence about him, authority about him, that they they instantly recognize we need to stop and listen to this guy. When he spoke, they listened. Jesus reached out and touched the coffin and the funeral procession stopped. And if you know anything about Eastern uh, culture, their funeral processions were loud and, and grief-stricken, and, and people crying out. So that was going on, and all of a sudden, everything stops. I think probably everything is quiet. And Jesus reached out and touched the coffin, and everyone's washing, watching and listening. It's like, what's going on here? Ever been there? What's going on, Jesus? This is happening. This is, what's going on? Jesus amazed the people and said this. Verse 15. I say to you, young man, get up. Really? Really? I say to you, young man, get up. Who does Jesus think he was? Who does, what did he think he could do? What did this young man, did he think he really wasn't dead? He was just sleeping? Or did this Jesus really think he could bring this young man back to life? Jesus spoke and the dead man, the dead son responded. Verse 15, the dead man sat up and began to talk. Now, you're in this crowd, okay? This isn't just a Bible story. You're in the crowd and you just saw this happen and you're going, I'm, I'm guessing their eyes were big as saucers as we say. 
Jesus exercised his authority over death. The son is alive and talking. Again, can you picture this happening? The son who was dead is alive and talking. Did you ever wonder what he said? It's like, hey, what's happening, folks? What am I doing here? Come on, get this stuff off me. I'm hungry, let's go out for supper. Or whatever he said. But he said something to, again, prove that he really was alive, that they all weren't just experiencing some phenomena. And there is this mother and the people standing there in amazement. Verse 16, all the people were amazed and began praising God, saying, a great prophet. They didn't know he was the son of God yet. A great prophet has come to us. God has come to help his people. They recognized that he wasn't just an ordinary guy. They recognized that there was something about him that was unique and different. And Jesus gave back to this woman her son. Verse 15, Jesus gave him back to his mother. No longer childless, no longer alone, no longer grieving this great loss. The saddest day of her life also almost... Or, the saddest day of her life became the happiest day of her life. I, I've never seen a dead person come back to life. I know it's happened, and sometimes in the countries where medical insurance and doctors aren't available, it happens. But I still believe Jesus responds to our pain and our suffering, even though we don't have enough faith. Jesus back, brings people back, back together, sometimes from sickness, sometimes from rejection, sometimes he brings people back together, loving parents with a prodigal son or a daughter. Sometimes he brings separated husbands and wives back together. Sometimes he heals conflicted and divided churches and brings them back together. Sometimes it is healing of the wounds that have separated friends that brings them back together. Jesus delights when those who were apart are brought back together. When those who are sad are able to rejoice again. Now notice the contrast between the centurion and the widow, first story and second story. In one scene is a powerful and confident and hopeful soldier who asks Jesus to heal. In the other story is this vulnerable helpless, hopeless, grieving widow that didn't even know she could ask Jesus for help. In one, there's this absolute faith, this amazing faith. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. In the other, there's only the sounds of grief so profound that no words can express her needs. Now, I hope you see it. The difference between the centurion and the widow illustrate that Jesus doesn't always fit into a set pattern. We don't have to be in this set pattern in order to receive Jesus' help. Jesus' compassion isn't dependent upon me saying the right words or having the right kind of faith. Jesus sometimes intervenes in our lives even when we don't ask him to. Even when we don't know that we could ask him to. The fact that this grieving widow never asked Jesus for a miracle is what makes it a miracle in itself. Amazing, isn't it? The great faith of the centurion inspires us. 
But the widow's silence gives me hope, gives us hope that even in our weakest moments, Jesus can help. Even when we don't have great faith, Jesus can come through. Main point. Well, there's kind of two takeaways. Jesus doesn't only respond to great faith. So that person that comes along and says, well, if you had enough faith, this would happen. If you had enough faith, this would happen. God would do this. Jesus would do that. No, that's not true. This woman had no faith, and Jesus came through. Yes, the centurion had great faith, and Jesus responded to it. But Jesus also responded to the widow who had no faith. Jesus responds to great faith. He also responds to no faith, and I'm so glad he does. Two takeaways. Number one, remember, faith, our faith, is almost always mixed with unbelief. Isn't it? At least mine is. So as you pray, keep it honest. And keep it simple. And keep it up. Mark chapter 9, verse 24. Jesus said to the powerless father, everything is possible him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help my unbelief. And that's where I'm at so often in my faith. I do believe, help my unbelief. Second takeaway. Remember that God has not always promised to answer our prayers the way we want him to. Too many people think that the answered prayer is dependent upon them having great faith. Again, I do believe we can pray and ask Jesus for help. I do believe that Jesus may not answer my prayer the way I want him to, no matter how much faith or how little faith I have. I do believe that God has promised always to be with me. Great faith or no faith, he's promised to be with me. And sometimes I don't ask God to intervene in the way I would like him to, I simply say, God, be with me. Be with them as they journey. Give them the strength and the courage to faithfully follow Jesus. Because faith is obeying God in spite of the circumstances and in spite of the consequences because sometimes the consequences are really difficult to handle. I had a, uh, a nephew who went through desert storm. He was a, a Marine Force recon Marine. That's kind of like a, a uh, special forces or that's like a... Navy SEALs. He went into Iraq before the soldiers came and they found out where the minefields were. They found out where the enemy emplacements were. He would go in at night and at daytime he would bury himself in the sand. He and his group would bury themselves in the sand with a little periscope. And he said one time they came within 10 feet of me, never knew I was there. He went through that, he went through the second war, he went through Bosnia. Later on in his career, he was stationed at the Pentagon before 9-11. When that airplane came in, it came into his office area, destroyed all of his paraphernalia, all his memorabilia. But he was down the hall when that happened. He retired from the Marines and became a locksmith 
and he was in the parking lot helping a woman start her car. And the 15-year-old kid with a gun in his hand came up and robbed him and shot him in the head and killed him. He went through all of that. And yet a 15-year-old kid took his life, leaving his wife with seven boys. The point is, sometimes God answers prayer miraculously. And sometimes God says, no, you're going to go through this. And it wasn't because his wife had less faith than somebody else. It was because God said, this is the way it's going to be. And she continued, that mother, to obey God in spite of the circumstances and in spite of the consequences. And that's what he calls us to do. So if your people wasn't little faith, it's okay. If your people with no faith, it's okay. Jesus enters into our, our life not because we have great or no faith, but because of his will and his concern and his love for us. Jesus responds to great faith, but he also responds to no faith. And I'm so grateful he does. Let's pray. Father, life continues to confuse me. Life continues to be unfair. Life continues to be not having your will done on earth as done in heaven. But God, in this journey that you have us on, this journey of following Jesus, this journey of doing Jesus, doing life Jesus' way, is a journey you've put us on. And I pray you would continue to help us to know that you're with us and you will give us the strength and you'll give us those amazing times where we see you do miraculous things. And you'll also help us through those times when you don't. And Jesus, we believe that you're the same Jesus in both scenarios. And we're grateful that you've given us the privilege to follow you, to love you, and to serve you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
it's who I am.